Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our speaker this evening is Director of the Westminster Institute. In his 25 years of government service, Robert Riley served as Special Assistant to the President, Director of the Voice of America, Senior Advisor for Information Strategy to the Secretary of Defense, and taught at National Defense University. Mr. Riley attended Georgetown University and the Claremont Graduate University and has published widely on American politics and morals, foreign policy, and classical music. His numerous publications include Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything, Surprised by Beauty, A Listener's Guide to the Recovery of Modern Music, and The Closing of the Muslim Mind how intellectual suicide created the modern Islamic crisis. His most recent book, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding, was just published in April. We are delighted to have him back at the Institute of Catholic Culture, and please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Riley. The floor is all yours. Melanie, thank you very much. Now, America is on trial in a number of ways that are evident to you all certainly in the streets, in the toppling of various statues, with the 1619 Project of the New York Times. But that's, that's pretty much old hat, very familiar to see America attacked from the left and obviously from the Marxist left. What about the critique of the American founding that's being made um, in certain religious conservative circles, or to be more specific, Catholic circles. Uh, Those, let us say, inspired me to write this book to answer the charges that the American founding was a poison pill with a time release formula because it had been fatally contaminated with enlightenment principles of radical individual autonomy. And as the tide of Christianity has receded, uh, these principles of radical individual autonomy have been made more manifest as they are in so many unfortunate Supreme Court rulings, most recently by Justice Gorsuch and many by Justice Anthony Kennedy that finds in our Constitution the right to sodomy, the right to homosexual so-called marriage, uh, the right to transgenderism, and, and all kinds of things that would seem on the face of it, to be quite incompatible with the laws of nature and of nature's God referred to in our Declaration of Independence. Is this true? Was the founding a poison pill? Well, I I address the arguments specifically from Patrick Deneen, whom I I think uh, you you were introduced to, and also Michael Hanby at the John Paul II Institute. Patrick Deneen takes a kind of anthropological approach in his critique, saying the American founders had the wrong idea of what who man is. And Michael Hanby taking a more metaphysical approach that they have the idea of being itself wrong. Now, I I have to say about these two thinkers, first of all, that they are right about so many things. I admire them both. I've learned from them both. Their critiques of modernity are appropriately scathing, and particularly in the case with Michael Hanby, metaphysically deep, very, very fine. As right as they are about many things, I believe they're wrong about the founding, and I say so in the book. I don't think there's evidence to substantiate their point of view from the founders themselves. However, the main body of the book is not a response to these critiques or criticisms of them. It's 
trying to answer the question, what made the American founding conceivable? What ideas had to be present uh, for it to happen? And what is the, the lineage of these ideas? From where did they first come? What's their provenance? Uh, what's the quality of that provenance? And the attempt to answer that very difficult question took me back, first of all, to provide context to pre-philosophical, pre-Judaic revelation periods of ancient tribal man, to understand what was the tribal mentality like. Then the impact upon that tribal mentality of Greek philosophy, the gift of the Greeks, reason, as Benedict XVI called it, that was a revolutionary impact. So was also the Jewish revelation of a monotheistic God in a Middle Eastern world that was a sea of polytheism. Then, of course, the advent of Christianity itself, perhaps the most revolutionary event ever to have taken place in the world. I'd say without these three sources, and I talk about how their influences were slowly developed, and most particularly in the Middle Ages, where they became the foundation for the articulation of every single modern democratic constitutional principle. And then I talk about what derailed that development. If all these principles were articulated and to some extent instantiated in the medieval political order, why wasn't there a straight line from them to the American founding? What happened in the intervening years? I also try to answer that question and what happened in short, as I'll try to explain in greater detail, uh, in the late Middle Ages was William of Ockham and following him, Luther and the Reformation, the establishment of the divine right of kings, or in the secular sphere, the absolute sovereignty of the state and the thought of Thomas Hobbes and his Leviathan. I then present the American Revolution as a reaction against these things and as a restoration of those medieval political constitutional principles. Let's go back. In trying to uh, briefly sketch out to you, what was the tribal mind like? The pre-philosophical mind. Tribal man conceived of himself as nothing more than a member of his tribe. He couldn't think of himself as being outside the tribe. The tribe was constituted by of course, the tribal chieftain and allegiances to him, and most often uh, an origination in the gods of the tribe, either through direct descendants, in other words, the head of the tribe was a descendant of the gods, or through some special relationship. And the, that tribal head or the prince or the king was the medium through which the members of the tribe would present um, their petitions to the God. They couldn't do so directly. No one had that access other than the divine or the semi-divine ruler. Now, there, there was no vocabulary because there was no philosophy uh, for such a thing as a, a human being or for them to understand themselves as human being. There were only members of other tribes with different mores, different names, and different ways as they had different gods. The typical relationship between these tribes when they were not in treaty was war. And the typical uh, behavior uh, during war and after it was that conquest meant the slaughter of the members of the opposing tribe, or at least the slaughter of all the male members and the enslavement of the women and children. Neither the victorious tribe nor the defeated tribe could have expressed any moral objection to this behavior, because they had the defeated tribe won, they would have behaved in exactly the same way. Uh, the one thing they might have thought is that the gods of the victorious tribe were stronger because they had defeated the gods of the, the losing tribe. And what were the gods of the tribe for other than to protect it against its enemies and guarantee harvests? Now, you know, this is more evident when we're talking about just tribes. You can also speak of, of empires. You can speak of the ancient Egyptians, the divine origin of the pharaoh, 
that the pharaoh was the only means through which any member of his empire had any access to those gods, and the political order was arranged in proximity to the nearness to the pharaoh. And this obtained not only in life, but in death as well. Uh, The hierarchy of society was recognized by the closeness of one's grave to uh, the grave of the pharaoh. There wasn't such a clear demarcation between life and death, and there certainly wasn't a clear demarcation between the human and the non-human, as they were given to not only uh, respect the gods of Egypt, but the uh, there was a lot of shape-shifting of these gods into animals or rocks and trees, a great deal of divination, a great deal of superstition, not true of just the Egyptians, but of all the pre-philosophical ancient peoples. And in fact, there are pre- self, pre, sorry, pre-philosophical peoples who still exist today, of which you, we can see that this is true. So no term for human being, uh, no horizon beyond that of their tribe. This was greatly disrupted by the introduction of philosophy in the classical Greek world, which claimed that man's reason was able to not simply have opinions about things, but apprehend the truth of them, that the truth of things could be known, and that this truth was not dependent on any kind of political order or gods, uh, but was in the thing themselves and was universal. In other words, They thought they could understand the nature of things, and meaning that that understanding comported with the essence of what something was or what something is. They they observed that there is an order in the world, and that this order appears to be rational, that through their reason they can apprehend this order, which was called the laws, laws of nature or laws of reason. How could this be so? How is it that man's mind can apprehend the truth of things and apprehend where did this rational order come from? Well, several of the pre-Socratic philosophers, notably Heraclitus, maybe an Aximander, speculated that the world was apprehensible because behind it was a divine intelligence. And as far as we know, Heraclitus is the first one to have used the word logos to describe this divine intelligence. And as you you well know, the word logos in Greek means reason or word. So that was the origin of this rational nature. Now, the interesting thing about this is that a comprehension of the essence of a thing allowed one to judge what was good for it or what was bad for it. Let's say in respect to an acorn, one would know that the nature of the acorn was to become an oak tree and that nowhere along the trajectory of the growth of this acorn into an oak tree would it turn into a gazelle or something else. If the conditions proper for its growth were present, uh, a rich soil, Uh, abundant moisture, and so forth. Uh, In fact, one could come to judge what was good for this oak tree by what allowed it to reach its perfection. And its perfection was its growth into a fully mature oak tree. So water, good for it. Drought, bad for it. Too much acid in the soil, bad for it. Balanced uh, acidity in the soil, good for it. Good, bad, normative. What's normative for the oak tree? Now, in the natural world, these things were, uh, let us say, fairly automatic. The oak tree didn't reflect upon its end or uh, be able to travel to get water or think that drought was bad because obviously oak trees don't have minds. Only in the nature of man uh, was there a creature in the world who could apprehend the end of his nature and who had the free will to decide whether to Uh, undertake actions that were conducive to the perfection of that nature or actions that would subvert it. And so we find in Aristotle and other thinkers an ethics, as we know from the Nicomachean ethics, his great work, uh, how, how man ought to behave. This is very critical in terms of understanding both philosophy 
and modernity. Clearly from Aristotle and other thinkers, you could go from an is to an ought. What is the ought? The ought is the perfection of the thing from its the, the, the development of its nature, what it ought to be. When we know the sorry formal and final causes of things, which means we know their essences, we know what it ought to be and therefore what it ought not to be. And in terms of man, that translates into a morality, a morality that is normative, that can be known through man's reason. So man needs to rule himself rationally according to what is normative. What is wrong, what is immoral, is irrational. It's against reason. And this understanding of morality obtains in Thomas Aquinas, who specifically defined sin as irrationality, an act of irrationality. Um, This was extraordinary because it also was able to introduce the subject of what is just, what is unjust. Now, is when you can apprehend what it, what what is just and what is unjust according to man's nature, it must be just everywhere and at all times for all peoples. Applied, of course, with prudence of local circumstances, but nonetheless, uh, that was revolutionary. That justice doesn't exist according to the conventions of a tribe, but according to apprehensible universal truths. You know, we're never going to get out of Athens if I keep going on this. So I better quickly (laughs) segue over to Jerusalem. As I already mentioned, monotheism was an extraordinary uh, revelation in the sea of uh, polytheism in in the ancient world. Uh, And what was equally, uh, excuse me, equally extraordinary was this idea that Yahweh, the revealed God of the Jews, uh, was um, transcendent. He was not in this world, though he could act in it when he so chose. He transcended it. He was outside of it. This was beyond the kin of ancient man's imagination, who thought the gods were all within the universe, up in the Empyrean, but part of it. They didn't, they didn't understand what transcendent would mean. And also, of course, the other amazing thing is that this, this god, this omnipotent God created ex nihilo from nothing, and that everything he made, as is repeated in Genesis at the end of every majestic phrase on creation, and God found it was good. Everything he made was good. In fact, it's clear that he loved creation into being through his divine word. And what did he find to be particularly good? Particularly good, he found man to be particularly good. Why? Because he made him in his image and likeness. In his image and likeness, he made him. I would contend to you that any notion of human rights in the modern world has its ultimate source back in the revelation of Genesis, that a human being is inviolable, that there was something sacred because that human being is the possessor of this image of God within themselves, that they are inviolable. Even if one is not a Jew or a Christian, but who believes in human rights, they are beneficiaries of Genesis in one way or the other. The goodness of creation, by the way, was another um, stunning assertion, uh, which was not generally shared in the ancient world, which usually was constituted by contending principles of good and evil, of light and darkness, of demiurges, fighting it out in the primeval muck. And as so long as this this demiurge of light won, you could have this this, uh, semi-stable order, but the struggle between the demiurges was never over and occasionally erupt into the natural world, threatened to overwhelm it and send it back into the primeval muck. They didn't use the word so much creation, but if they had, they wouldn't say creation was, was all good. There was an underlying malignity too much of it. In a way, it could not be trusted. It was not something on which one could, uh, let us say, rely upon which one could confidently build. It therefore was open to the world of wild superstition and crazy divination. 
In the book, I give some samples of that divination from the Babylonians uh, that you might find quite amusing, you know, whether they they were specialized in divination from sheep livers, others did it from the entrails of birds, etc. Uh, you can find in the Old Testament vigorous condemnations of divination, necromancy, and, of course, of idolatry. And y- therefore, you find in Jewish revelation a ter- uh, an optimism, an optimism from the reliability of creation, the goodness of what God has made. And you have another thing that breaks through, and that is history. The ancients did not believe in such a thing as history because the world was eternal. It had no beginning, middle, or end. It was in a giant loop. Everything that could happen would happen, and then it would start all over again. There, there was an inherent futility to this, you see. And man was simply a insignificant thing, a plaything of the gods, here today, gone tomorrow. History began with the Jews. There was a beginning in creation ex nihilo. There would be an end. Uh, this was under God's providence. There was also an account for evil, of course, which was quite different from that of any surrounding culture in man's disordered will and his desire to be himself uh, as a God, as we know from, again, from Genesis. He shall be as God, so Adam and Eve eat the apple. An original sin uh, uh, instills in that good creation a kind of disorder, a, not a kind of, a disorder, As St. Paul says so many years later, all creation groans, not just man. And we are groaning within ourselves, awaiting our adoption. Um, So it it solves a problem, but it sets up one, too. Judaic revelation is the beginning of history because it's, it's the beginning of salvation history. And salvation history is the foundation of really any kind of history. Therefore, uh, soon after Genesis or at the end of Genesis, we begin the prophecy of how the, orig- the original order and goodness of creation is going to be restored. And we know this is through a Messiah who is foretold in a variety of ways uh, who he's going to be, what he's going to do, etc. Et Thus, we arrive at Christian revelation and the astonishing claim, as we know from the majestic announcement at the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Logos, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, the Logos, was with God, and the Word, Logos, was God. And all things were made through him as Logos. Well, now we know why there's a rational order in nature, don't we? God himself is reason. But Logos is incarnate. What if Heraclitus, speculating on this divine intelligence uh, behind uh, the order in the world, what if this Logos walks through the door. That is the experience of a Hellenized Christianity or of a Christianized Hellenism. That is what made the claims of the New Testament comprehensible to the largely Greek-influenced world of its time. Of course, it was comprehensible in its own revelational terms uh, as to what Christ was doing. And what, what he did quite clearly, was universalize the truths of the Jewish revelation. Uh, We could say that Judaism, the the God of Judaism is a universal God in a tribal religion. Christianity is is a universal God in a universal religion. And the revelation of Christ and Christ's redemptive action extends and deepens well, it extends universally and then deepens incomparably what the imago dei means, that each individual person is the object of infinite love and Christ's redemptive love. This also means very, very significantly for our topic that that redemption is available to that individual through his or her relationship with Christ and God, which is not mediated by any political order. This was a shocker for the ancient world that forever demoted the status of the political and brought forth a different understanding of what the political is or should be. 
that the highest goal of man is outside the political order, and that this life in Christ, this ultimate union with the divine, the actual divinization of man offered through God's grace, is the destiny of man. The the destiny of man is revealed in Christ. His purpose is finally known, and it has nothing to do uh, with a political order. It has something to do with the church, of course, but not with the political order. It has enormous political ramifications in any society which becomes Christian. And as we will see, the revelation uh, is so profound that it formed the basis of a new civilization. That civilization, as it developed uh, into the Middle Ages, uh, was it was, became known, obviously, as Christendom. And I have to jump quickly ahead here because I, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left. Well, you know, one of the, the key uh, quotes from the New Testament that is so often made is our Lord's statement when they try to trick him with a denarius, uh, you know, should we pay our taxes to the Romans, whose image is this, and so forth. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. This, of course, was a revolutionary statement. And it's a, the uh, they just the gospel description is that the crowd was amazed at, at our Lord's statement. Of course, they'd be amazed. Anybody in the ancient world would be amazed by such a remark that there was a difference between uh, what's Caesar and what's God's. After all, Caesar was a god. No more. Now, this became the foundation of the two swords teaching, and this was articulated most famously by Pope Gelasius at the end of the 5th century, when he instructs the emperor, we have two separate realms here. I would no more consider telling you what to do in the secular political realm than I'm sure you would uh, think you could tell me what to do in the spiritual and moral realm. Uh, What we have here really are dual sovereignties. Uh, The sovereignty of the political order, which Christ himself acknowledged, you know, he knew certain things, after all, are Caesar's. But certain things are are his as expressed through his church. And this dual sovereignty is exercised over the same people. This was an, an entirely new development in the world. Now, try to instantiate that in a society and in a political order. And you see what happens uh, starting in the early Middle Ages when the institutionalization of the church really takes form in the corporations it sets up, and in the contest with the kings and emperor over the famous investiture uh, controversy. Who gets to uh, appoint and invest? The bishops, the pope, or the prince, or the king. After the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, in, in what's come to be known as the Dark Ages, the fragment, that fragmented world in which the church had to really rely on on the local prince, uh, given that he was a Christian, to to protect it. And the prince, during that period of time, uh, became a kind of sacral being. You know, he recovered some of the uh, divinity, let us say, almost divinity, which had been, from which he had been stripped by Christianity. In the early 11th century, the Pope uh, decides that we've got to desacralize the prince again and and get back the authority of the church. So there was a lot of bumping and nudging and conflicts in in England, in uh, the Holy Roman Empire, between the Pope and the princes, until you found a highly articulated uh, system of these two realms, the sacred and secular. And uh, because of this dual sovereignty, there was a greater space of freedom within which the individual could act because neither of these sovereignties could claim uh, absolute authority over any person because that person was both under the church and under the prince. And some, and both had their own court systems. And if one was being unfairly treated in one, he could flee to the other. Uh, Very, very, very interesting history to this. But what came to be articulated uh, in the medieval uh, canon law were these principles of constitutional government. And it happened in a fascinating way. Uh, As a result of the rediscovery of the Code of Justinian, 
they began looking at uh, Roman law and they began examining the uh, mess of canon law, just as Justinian law tried to rationalize uh, the many uh, traditions in Roman law and make some sense of it. So the medieval canonists said, we need to rationalize canon law and, and make some sense of it. So there was, by the famous canonist Gratian, a magisterial work called The Concordance of Discordant Canons, in which he undertook this great labor. Now, one of the uh, Roman law principles, it wasn't a principle, it was a... Um, it was just the result of the ruling in private law cases of, of something that will become very familiar uh, to you as we go along here. Uh, just to, to give the principle in Latin, it's quote omnes tangit ab omnibus approbari. It's what touches all must be approved by all. And what this was in, in Roman private law was when there were um, uh, several trustees of a piece of property or over a minor person, that property uh, couldn't be disposed of or the future of that person decided unless all the trustees agreed. That's what it meant. Uh, But it had no larger application. It had no political significance. It was just a matter of private law. Now, the canonists expanded upon this in church law, and it began to have applications in religious orders and church councils. What touches all must be approved by all. Now, that had particular application in laws and in any material things, most particularly in taxes. It became a concern of church councils, uh, particularly when the kings or princes were asking for larger contributions to the church. Where was that money to come from? Well, both the bishops and the popes decided that there should be no taxation without representation, and those affected by this would have to consent to it. Why would that be so? Well, because there was equality amongst those people. Uh, Their consent would be required because they're rational people who would be affected by the results of the decision. Now, how would their consent be expressed? By a right to vote. Well, what if they couldn't be there? Well, they had a right to representation. Now, as an example of this, I refer to the early Dominican, uh, the behavior in the Dominican order, including when St. Dominic was still alive, and they they would order the proctors of the various uh, Dominican abbeys to gather to consider various things that would affect the whole order. St. Dominic and uh, those who succeeded him said, what's decided at these chapter meetings uh, will be decisive. Uh, The chapter meeting is sovereign. So long as there are representatives from uh, every abbey, who are elected by the members of that abbey, who can represent them and accede or object to what's taking place. And so long as they agree, and it would be majority rule, in fact, a two-thirds vote became the rule in church councils and also for the election of the Pope, uh, that would be a decision then uh, that was constituted the rule of law to which all of them would be subject. So you had the articulation of all of these principles, which because these canonists, you know, they operated not only in the the ecclesiastical world, but there was a crossover into the secular world because they would work in royal courts and so forth. And you see these principles leaching into the secular realm and being uh, instantiated in the conduct of early parliaments and the early representation and the idea that became specifically articulated as no taxation without representation, that came from the quote omnis tangent uh, principle. Also articulated by Thomas Aquinas and all the uh, major thinkers of the Middle Ages were not only all the principles through which we've just gone, but the right to revolution. In fact, some called it the obligation to revolution against a tyrant, an unjust ruler. And why would you have such a right? Because the king or the ruler is not sovereign. It's the people who are sovereign. Why are they sovereign? Well, first of all, because they're all equal. And second of all, because God does not directly invest the ruler uh, with his authority. All authority comes from God, but how is it conveyed? And in terms of the secular realm, it is not directly from God to the king but rather through the people to the king who have to approve um, his becoming king. 
And that covenant they have with the king has to be kept by the king, which if he he violates it in a serious way, they have the right to revolution against him. Okay, well, as I say, these, these, these were generally acknowledged principles and practiced to a greater or lesser extent in Christendom in the Middle Ages. Now, a problem, a severe problem arose in the late Middle Ages. I think I ought to refer to a very key theological and philosophical issue. It was very much present in Thomas Aquinas, and that is, within God, is the divine intellect primary or the divine will? Aquinas answered, and I quote, will follows upon intellect. Will follows upon intellect. Reason rules, and the will follow. That was generally acknowledged it's the primacy of reason. It's why, it's why reason is, is primary, both in divine law and human law, why it's present in natural law, why it can be apprehended by reason. Now, what if you flip that relationship within God himself, and you say, no, no, it, it's not God's reason which is primary, it's his will that's primary. And the reason is secondary to such an extent that it's simply, it's, it's kind of an executor of whatever the will carries out. In other words, there's nothing inherently reasonable in what the will decides. The reason, the reason just finds the, the, the easiest way in which to execute whatever the will does decide. This has enormous consequences, which I'm, I'm just going to quickly adumbrate by reading to you a key sentence from my book that comes from a 20th century French thinker, Bertrand de Juvenal, it's on page 122, in which he says, quote, the man who finds in God, before all else, will and power, will be disposed to the same view of human government. Unquote. So if you find in God above all else will and power, you'll be disposed to take that same view of human government. There's an infamous statement uh, in Plato uh, in which Thrasymachus in the Republic says right is the rule of the stronger. So right is constituted by will, by strength, and the strongest will decides what's right. There's nothing inherently right or wrong. Um, This is kind of the theology of that view. And it was embraced by William of Ockham in the late Middle Ages. He said, will is primary in God. God's will is unrestricted by anything except maybe the principle of non-contradiction. Nothing is inherently right or wrong, but God says it so. There is no nature. Things have no essences. Words do not relate to some objective reality. They're only, they're purely conventional. Um, there is no, the, the, the order of, of, of nature is intelligible, unintelligible because things have no natures. Everything exists from moment to moment as a direct result of God's will, not because they have a nature. Uh, the acorn doesn't become a giraffe, uh, not because it has the nature of an acorn or an oak tree. It's just for the moment God decides not to turn it into a giraffe, but he might. And there's no saying if he does. So there is no natural order. There are no essences. There is no intelligibility to the world. What can, so you can't know what's right or wrong through your reason. Aristotle's ethics goes out the window. You can't know that. Why? Because other, it would restrict, were it true, it would restrict the omnipotence of God. They have a very strange uh, view of what God's omnipotence must mean in order for them to denude the world of its rational order. But that's what William of Ockham does to protect God's omnipotence, he thinks, right? We have to get rid of uh, this pagan thought that has infiltrated the church, by, by which he means, of course, Aristotle and, uh, and of course, uh, Thomas Aquinas's use of Aristotle. Now, the problem with William of Ockham's thought is that it so greatly influenced Martin Luther Martin Luther accepted this nominalist and voluntarist view of God. Uh, He had a voluntarist theology, which means God is pure will and power, unrestrained by anything. And he also inherited the view from Occam that uh, one cannot know through one's reason what's right or what's wrong. There is no right or wrong in things themselves, but God says it so. 
And by the way, Occam said God could change his mind anytime he wants. And in one notorious statement, he said, if God requires of us that we hate him, uh, he can do so. And there's nothing we could say against it. So Luther uh, thinks, well, okay, we can't know right or wrong. Our nature is so thoroughly corrupt. There's really no vestige of nature, but there's, I mean, of reason, but there's nothing in nature that would let us know these things regardless. So how do we know? Uh, We only have one source, uh, revelation. And it's only by following this revelation uh, that we can conform ourselves uh, to that will of God. But we can't even do that because we don't have any free will. We've been predetermined by God. Uh, So there's only this uh, notion of God's mercy to save whom he will, which is unrelated to any actions of the individual. Uh, there is no there's no relationship between grace and nature, as Thomas Aquinas taught. There's a total bifurcation between the two. Man does nothing in cooperation with God's race, grace that is in any way related to his salvation. That's a revolution. That's a, a, a monumental change in thought. Now, the political consequences of Luther's teaching was the absolute power of the prince. The prince was no longer constrained by the popular sovereignty of the people uh, based upon their equality. Uh, He didn't agree that people were equal, and he did not accept um, as a consequence that there was any requirement for consent. The people's consent was not required in their rule because God directly invested the ruler with his power, uh, which, as I say, was absolute. So there's no requirement of consent. There is no right of representation. Obviously, there's no right to vote. And most especially, there's no right to revolution. No matter what the prince does, no matter how tyrannical he becomes, there is no right to revolution. You can see the absolutist tendencies of uh, the state as it develops under this teaching And Luther also, by the way, burnt the canon law in front of the church at Wartenberg, and up in flames went all the church ecclesiastical corporations, uh, which had protected individuals under this dual sovereignty. One of the sovereignties was now gone, gone, because the prince became the head of the church. The the prince was re-sacralized under Lutherism, Lutheranism. He regained all those ancient powers. He was the head of the church. Luther turned to the prince for the reform of the church. Um, So that was one ground of the absolutism that developed and was later expressed so profoundly in James I and Sir Robert Filmer in his work, Patriarcha. Um, And of course, as I mentioned earlier in the work of Thomas Hobbes in in uh, not the divine right of kings, but in the absolute sovereignty, uh, the absolute power of the sovereign state over the individual. Thomas Hobbes was also anomalist and also a voluntarist to the extent that he he believed in God. He was he was a materialist. Uh, he believed in the total corruption of, of human nature, as did Luther. He was sort of like Luther without the redemptive grace of, of Christ. Uh, so the, the, the secular absolute state. Now, in opposition to particularly the teachings of divine right of rule, arose a couple of amazing champions. I think people will be surprised not only that these constitutional uh, principles developed in the Middle Ages within the church, but they, they were defended most powerfully by an Italian bishop, Robert Bellarmine, and a Spanish Jesuit, Roberto Suarez. Not Roberto, uh, boy, it was Suarez his first name. Excuse me, I'm lapsing on that. They uh, ar- argued very powerfully against the divine right of kings, and in terms of exactly the constitutional principles, which I have uh, mentioned earlier. Who said all men are created equal? You think it was Thomas Jefferson or, or John Locke? It was Bellarmine and, and Suarez, that men have the, the right to consent in their rule, that there are no legitimate laws to which they haven't consented. Robert Bellarmine, Suarez. Now, Phil, Robert Filmer, the greatest apologist for divine right of kings, wrote this work, Patriarcha, 
defending the divine right of kings in which he knew he had to refute or take on uh, Bellarmine and Suarez. And so he does. Uh, Throughout the book, he quotes extensively Bellarmine. Bellarmine says this, I say that. Suarez says this, I say that. And Bellarmine and Suarez are a powerful rearticulation of and development of uh, natural law teaching. Now, on the Protestant side, there was Algernon Sidney, who also wrote against uh, the Filmer in his work, Discourses on Government. He used classical natural law thought, though he was an Anglican, uh, to the same effect. And he had to acknowledge Bellarmine's work because he's arguing against Filmer and Filmer principally addresses himself against Bellarmine and Suarez. So somewhat begrudgingly, Algernon Sidney has to say, yep, we, we know Bellarmine makes these great arguments, uh, but it's, you know, we try, he says, but those, that's, the, that's the general sense of mankind which is fine. That's what Bellarmine says it was, and that's what Suarez says it was. This was the general understanding of things, overthrown by these absolutists. I don't have time to mention that Sidney was heavily influenced by Richard Hooker, who was the first Anglican theologian who I say saved uh, Protestantism from itself by uh, restoring Thomist and Aristotelian thought uh, to the Anglican form of Protestantism. And uh, Algernon Sidney relied very heavily on him. Why is that important? Well, most of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Anglicans. They knew all about Richard Hooker. And what's more, all of them knew about Algernon Sidney because he was a hero in the American colonies and considered a Republican martyr. And they would, of course, see in the work of, of Sidney, his invocation of Richard, his, his frequent invocation of Richard Hooker. In addition to Sidney's enormous influence on the American founding, you have his contemporary John Locke, who also wrote against Robert Filmer. The first of his two famous treaties on government, the first one is a devastating critique of Filmer's divine right of kings defense. He destroys Filmer. And the second uh, treatise, which is the one on which the American founders, I won't say relied most, but which was quoted most, both from the pulpit and by the thinkers of the time, rearticulated these constitutional principles that we've mentioned, most particularly the right to revolution. And it was Locke's vigorous defense of the right to revolution, which most attracted the American founders to his thinking. It was very congenial obviously, to what they were doing. But Locke had a big influence on the American founding. And because he's sort of the window through which thinkers like Deneen and Hanby attack the American founding, their contention is that John Locke was really Thomas Hobbes with a smiley face, that he was really a Hobbesian. And it's through that Hobbesian influence on Locke that the poison entered the bloodstream of the American founding and why we have what is turning into now a Hobbesian state here in the United States. And I think I would find very little argument in this audience or amongst many that this is what, unfortunately, the United States is becoming uh, with a claim of absolute sovereignty over us, which is in the state and does not come from the people, uh, if I could just, in a little byway, during this coronavirus crisis, we can see certain governors enjoying the powers of the Leviathan, um, assuming powers to rule that are quite extraordinary. I'm in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the governor here, uh, on his own, uh, decided to declare that going to church was an essential service, therefore you may not go, but getting an abortion is an essential service, so go ahead and get your abortion. That's Leviathan speaking. Uh, when may you leave your house to where you may go? How, much, how, how may you dress? Uh, 
assume the anonymity of your face mask and so forth. I'm not making fun, by the way, of sensible health precautions. I just note who is enjoying the assumption of these extraordinary powers at this time. And what it does is it exposes the feature of Leviathan so we can all see it. So I'm not arguing that we're not in that danger. I'm simply saying it didn't come from the American founding. In the very end of the book, I do write an epilogue, which I say, if it's not the founding's fault, whose fault is it? And I go on to suggest an answer to that. It would require another book to do it well. In brief, I say the Germans did it. Why? Because it's the German <clears throat> school of a uh, 19th century German school of historicism <clears throat> that infested American education. Anyone who wanted to uh, have higher education with a certain eclat left the United States and studied in German universities. German professors were invited over here uh, and became professors in American universities. What do I mean by historicism? That history, the truth is a product of its time. Times change, so does truth. Truth is relative to its time. Now, the claims of the Declaration of Independence are, no, there are certain transcendent truths that rights are unalienable because they come from God not in the late 18th century, but always everywhere at all times. Now, that's either a universal immutable truth or it's not. <clears throat> According to German historicism, it's not. Uh, and that became a broadly accepted view in American education. And it morphed into, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, into moral relativism and then into progressivism. And you saw progressivism in, in uh, people like uh, President Wilson, uh, his uh, uh, criticisms of the Constitution, because what we needed was a modern state with centralized power uh, to affect improvements in man, that uh, if you're going to read the Declaration of Independence and understand it, you first of all have to get rid of that that pesky preamble, the one that talks about laws of nature and nature's God, and on those unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No, no, we can't have those in the progressive state. And so we are, we see uh, this, this school of progressivism active today, uh, particularly in one political party, which uh, thinks we need to be improved and can only be improved by the assumption of greater powers uh, by the state, and which will do that for us. By the way, I'm going to just talk about some of the riots and the grievances we see in the streets reminds me of the French Revolution in a way. One chapter in the book compares the French and American revolutions uh, so that we can so clearly understand which was the product of the ra radical enlightenment and which was not. The, the French Revolution uh, required for its success a profound dechristianization campaign. Uh, why? Because it was premised on the perfectibility of man. The American Revolution was quite the opposite. There was no notion of, of the perfectibility of man. Why? Because the founders were overwhelmingly Christian, who believed man was only perfectible uh, through the grace of God and his divine mercy. He couldn't perfect himself. Certainly the state could not perfect him, nor should the state be ever thought of as a salvific engine. And therefore, it, it is necessarily limited and must be kept limited. Uh, now, the rioters and, and marchers today, with their sense of grievance, Christians, broadly speaking, uh, believe we're in need of repentance. We're in need of contrition. We look to God alone and his mercy and love for our salvation. And so long as we conform ourselves to his divine will, that's the only perfection for which we can hope. Some of the rioters and angry people in the street seem to think that they should already be perfect. And the reason they're not is somebody else's fault. So let's go get those people. Or maybe it's the institution's fault. So let's take down those institutions because the state of nature is really one of uh, perfection. There is no original sin. We don't need contrition. Uh, it's a form of, let us say, self-salvation uh, that, that we... Um, not only can reach our own perfections, we should already be perfect, and therefore uh, radical political action is required. 
that has absolutely nothing to do with the founding. It's antithetical to the founding. I think that um, what has happened, our moral dissolution today, has taken place not as a kind of fulfillment of the founding, but contrary to its principles. And politically, our principal hope is a return to those principles, not a rejection of them. Thank you so much for this absolutely fascinating lecture. It was really an honor to, to hear you speak. And yes, we will be taking questions and answers. Looks like we actually have quite a few coming in. Well, I, I you know, since someone was so kind enough to suggest I continue the talk, can I just say a, a couple brief things? Yes. Okay. What I, the entire fulcrum of the book, the hinge on which it turns, is this contest, this struggle between the primacy of reason and the primacy of will. Mm-hmm. And the the contention in the book is that the American founding was a restoration of the primacy of reason after the expression of the primacy of will in the absolutism of, well, you could say of George III, but really of the British Parliament, which claimed absolute powers over the American colonies at the time, particularly the right to, to rule them without their consent, and obviously to tax them without their consent. So that's the chain, that that primacy of reason versus the primacy of will. The only other thing I want to say very quickly is that one thing about which the founders were unanimous was that the Republican government, which they had instituted, could only succeed insofar as the American people were virtuous. Virtue was the sine qua non for the success of the American Republic. I can elaborate on that, Melanie, if anyone has questions as we go on. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, we actually do have a question on that topic. And that is, how would you propose that America return to its founding principles? And I think this is directly related to, to your point about virtue in man. Well, they can't return to them if they don't know what they are. Mm-hmm. So first of all, it's it, they have to be uh, rearticulated, they, they, they have to be expressed, and they have to be defended. I think the last thing we ought to be doing is saying that those principles are themselves responsible for the great state of moral decay in which we are. And that's why I take such v- vigorous uh, exception to to Patrick Deneen's thesis and Michael Handy's thesis. I think it removes, I think it removes the grounds for our possible recovery. And and it leaves us with nothing else but, you know, to go home and pray. And I'm sorry, mm-hmm. that's not the Christian program. We need to yeah. be in the public public realm. We need to engage. You know, I I I dedicate this book uh, to the memory of Major Robert R. Egan, uh, who was a major in the U.S. Army Air Corps, an intelligence officer. I was named after him. I never got to meet him because he was killed uh, in World War II, for which he volunteered. He didn't have to go. He was in his late 30s. He insisted on going because he was a single man, and if he didn't, a married man would have to go. He thought the country was worth fighting for. He gave his life for it. I know many of you have family stories that are similar. So the book's dedicated to his memory and, of course, to my children carrying on, one of whom is a Marine Corps officer serving now. Um, They think the country is worth defending, fighting for, uh, when necessary, giving their lives for. What is it that's so worthwhile that they should do that? How How can we tell them otherwise? that this is an ignoble, low thing that has brought us to a state of moral corruption. You see, I, 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 I cannot accept that on several levels. The level on which I deal with it in the book is that it's simply wrong. I mean, it's historically wrong. It, there's, there's simply, there's no, the evidence is, is not there to substantiate it. But it, it's, it's a very, it's a harmful teaching. It couldn't come at a worse time. Oh, Annie, yes. It's, it's my impression that, that some of the people that are against 
the founding fathers and, and calling everything into question, the birth of the country, was the fact that of, of slavery and that Blacks, slaves, were considered three-fifths of a person. So how, how can we somehow understand, you know, or, or, or um, you know, take the intention, but then try somehow to, I, I don't know how you, you fix this other thing, <laughs> you know? Well, they... They weren't sure how to fix it. They were they were hoping it was a uh, a great evil that could uh, resolve itself over the course of time peacefully. When that didn't prove to be the case, it was resolved in a terrible civil war, as you know. Why was there a civil war over this question? Because the founding principle of the United States is that all people are created equal. There was no exception. For blacks, Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner, considered slavery a great evil. They all did, almost without exception. They 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 thought that. Now here's the problem: slavery had existed from time immemorial. For all of recorded history, there was slavery. Slavery was the norm, not the exception. How is it that the objections to slavery arose in the first place? <clears throat> As we know. They, they arose in England and the United States. England succeeded in eliminating it sooner than the United States did, uh, but they both did so <clears throat> on both Christian grounds and rational grounds, that we have a human nature, meaning that all people are equally human. Every thinker I propose to you tonight, with, with the exception of, you know, Hobbes and some Luther, uh, knew that, agreed to it. Uh, it, it, was, it was only as these principles suffused society and political order that the elimination of the great evil of slavery became possible. Now, the 1619 Project, I find, is extremely odd. Uh, because the only thing it objects to is black slavery, which of course is a very objectionable, but it says nothing about the slavery that the uh, uh, Native Americans were practicing at the time. Why wasn't that a problem? I'll tell you, the American Natives were tribes, and in their behavior, they exhibited every um, attribute of the tribal mentality that I spelled out in the first part of the lecture tonight. Uh, their wars, uh, their tribal wars were incredibly brutal. The torture is um, almost beyond belief. And uh, the slavery be ubiquitous. You know, this now the, <laughs> the Supreme Court has decided to give the eastern part of Oklahoma back to the Indian tribes. And one objection to their doing so <clears throat> is the fact that uh, those tribes sided with the Confederacy in the Civil War, uh, because they had slaves then. They had slaves back there in 1860 uh, in, in their tribal territories. Uh, and therefore, the, the argument against giving that part of Oklahoma back is that they had sort of abrogated their, their sovereign rights by siding with the Confederacy, which lost the war. So the, the, I don't think that the existence of slavery is any puzzle. It's how the puzzle is, is, is its elimination. How did that happen? What ideas made that possible? And who had them? From where did they come? Well, I hope I gave some idea of that tonight. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the last thing you should try to do is destroy a country premised on the principle that we're all created equal and, and that at a great price eliminated, eliminated slavery. By the way, I should also mention to you the three-fifths clause, slavery, of course, isn't mentioned in the Constitution. They didn't want to mention it because they, they disapproved of it. The three-fifths clause was to lessen the power of the states that had slaves because they thought if they exercised, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a measure to limit the power of the slave states. It was not meant in any way to imply that slaves were not fully human beings. That also was expressed 
at the same time by the Northwest, Northwest Ordinance, which, of course, constituted those upper Midwest states from which slavery was forever forbidden. And the Constitution had the, the provision for passing a law there early in the 19th century to forbid the slave trade, which, of course, they did. So it's, it's, the, the picture is a little more nuanced than the critics today are allowing. Okay, okay sure. thank you. Um, let's finish with these questions. Uh, two questions, which are, which are slightly related, but looking at it from two different perspectives. One is from Matthew, who's asking how the teaching about the social reign of Christ the King affects our understanding of the founding of America as a religion neutral state. And a question came in from John, who's asking, is not expressed theology of many of the founders relevant? In other words, how can we expect a pack of deists, either implicitly or explicitly, to stumble into a Thomistic political order? <laughs> Those are that's very good. Yes. Thank you. I'm gonna just take a little nip at that last question. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no deists in the American founding. That's one answer. There were there were a few theists, uh, like Benjamin Franklin and Though Jefferson considered himself a Christian, it would be a very odd kind of Christian. He was more of a theist. Now, what's the difference between a deist and a theist? The deist is the um, the clockmaker conception of uh, God. He he winds up this clock and then he goes away. He's indifferent to his creation. Uh, he's not a provident God. He just takes off. A deist doesn't believe that. He, he can, a theist doesn't believe that. He believes in a providential God, a God who guides his creation, who intends the best for man, and who at times intervenes uh, for uh, that, that the best for man may happen. So they're, they're really quite uh, different from each other. And those theists were in a minority. As I said, the the majority of people signing the Declaration were Anglicans, admittedly, some of them, you know, nominal Anglicans. Mm -hmm. And there were many uh, Calvinists uh, in the northeastern United States. Now, how do they become Thomists? Well, that's the gift. The great gift of the Catholic Church was their inheritance of natural law. And that was conveyed to them by great thinkers like Richard Hooker, uh, Algernon Sidney, and to, to a certain extent by John Locke. So it wasn't, it wasn't alien to them. It was a shared inheritance. And to the extent to which some of those um, sects had a problem with natural law, say in the late 16th century, uh, they, were, they were very different by the late 18th century. The, the complexion had changed. The, the attitude toward natural law had changed. You know, they weren't radical Puritans in the Northeast anymore. Melanie, I'm sorry. I yeah. forget, was there was some other part to his oh, question? Yes. Um, both the questions were sort of asking about the influence of of like Christian tradition on the founding fathers. And then two, the, sec the second question was sort of assuming that the founding fathers were strongly influenced by their deistic or theistic background? And did that not have a massive effect on the, on the founding principles? No. They, the founders were overwhelmingly Christian. It was a founding by Christians, though I wouldn't call it a Christian founding. Why not? Because of the distinction between the secular and the religious, the principles in the Declaration of Independence are philosophical principles, not religious principles. And that means that anyone who accepts those, those truths as being self-evident can be an American citizen, even if they're not a Christian. Can a Jew be a good citizen? Washington thought so. In fact, he even thought a Catholic could be a good citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was also the principle of religious freedom, one thing that was faced squarely by some of the thinkers in the early Enlightenment period 
was the incredible violence from the religious wars that had torn the continent and, and England apart. How could people live together when they belonged to different sects? If they were only going to live according to the revelation and they interpreted the revelation differently, well, that's a prescription for endless war. That's one reason why John Locke was writing and saying, well, well now, wait a minute, there's, there, we've, there's a different way in which to ground a government uh, whose principles we can all share. And there, there, these are certain truths. There, there's this law of reason that obtains in the state of nature, according to which we should live. And, you know, th- that we need to treat each other with that respect that is accorded to the fact that we're all made in the Imago Dei, even if you have, you, you belong to different sects. You know, you might say, well, yes, I'd prefer to live in a Catholic culture, and this is not one, but my wife is Spanish. I spent a lot of time in Europe. Uh, good luck in Spain. The, the Catholic cultures in Europe, I'm afraid, are even in worse shape than the United States. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a kind of uh, nostalgic imagination involved in this idea that uh, this, you know, we can only live according to the truth if we're in an explicitly Catholic culture. When I, you know, that's, that's, you know, not, not so, I, I believe. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Like, all you had to say was fascinating, and it raises so many questions. Please look into his book, America on Trial, available on Ignatius Press or Amazon. Yes, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.